Okay, so very warm welcome on this snowy day in London. And I'm Professor Julie Davies, uh, Director of the MBA Health at the Global Business School for Health, which is a new business school in the Faculty um, of Population Health Sciences at University College London. So this is part of a C CPD program. And what I'm going to focus on today is systems leadership and hybrid leadership. So there's a lot of talk about hybrid at the moment, working from home and going into work. Um, what we mean by hybrid leadership is not that, it's about a particular kind of leader who crosses many boundaries. So they may be a clinical uh, leader, they may be, um, for instance, a director of nursing or a director of the medical operation, but they're also on the board, perhaps of an acute hospital or, or of a private healthcare organization. So we're looking at uh, the bigger picture of systems and hybrid leadership within the context, growingly in the UK, at least of integrated healthcare systems. So I've got various sections uh, that I will break off and uh, open up for discussion for your Q&A. So I came across this cartoon the other day, uh, this teacher, this instructor talking to her students, uh, children today, we're going to learn code. Um, it's important for your prosperous future. And I thought that was quite interesting because often when we join organizations, there are, kind, there are formula, there are norms, there are codes of behavior. And of course we have to learn codes more generally, but also as the students respond in this cartoon, uh, we need to see the bigger picture of issues such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We're in a much bigger ecosystem within healthcare systems and also planetary ecosystems. So the response from the class to her comment is, could we actually learn about how to survive uh, in a civilization threatened by ecosystem collapse, rising sea levels, uh, geopolitical turmoil, as we've seen in Ukraine, the last month or so, armed conflict, increasing polarization of ideologies. We saw the Oscars and uh, the consternation that caused of uh, violence in public and humanity's seemingly insatiable appetite for material goods, for stuff. So I'd like to put what we're discussing today within the much broader um, global healthcare challenge of ensuring good health and well-being. That's why we're all here today, I'm sure. So I have three learning outcomes for your CPD. The one is to understand the kind of definitions. What is a systems leadership and integrated um, hybrid leadership and networking collaboration that is very strongly policy at the moment? So what do we mean by these, these definitions and how do we critically evaluate them? So what are the pros and cons um, of leaders and leadership at all? Um, and then for you to think and discuss with us as part of your CPD, how do you lead? You may not have, or you may have a senior leadership position or you may be an informal leader, but how do you become a change agent and lead proactively to support that sustainable development goal three while of course we're dealing with huge emergencies within COVID pandemic, elective backlogs and so on. So what small wins can you make within your sphere of influence to support the whole system? And then finally, we've got various tools like systems maps, stakeholder analysis, networking, um, SNA, social networking analysis, and various tools that you might find useful as part of unpicking these are quite abstract terms. And for me, leadership is about context. It's about social interactions. It's about processes. It's about relationships. It's not just about, you know, always you're, you typically, you know, the president of the US is over six feet tall. It's not just about traits. It is how you behave, how you interact with others ethically. Um, to advance and progress your organization and your objectives. And I was very disappointed with the news about this survey. Most of uh, these points were declining this survey in England with a 648 
1,000, over 648,000 staff responding to the survey last year, and the results were just published recently. Um, but there were two good points, I think, um, points three and four, that there has been an increase in staff feeling safe to speak out about concerns, and uh, there was a rise in people in the healthcare sector within England uh, feeling more secure about raising concerns about clinical leadership and unsafe clinical practices. So clearly we've been bombarded in the media with those results. And today, uh, clearly the issue of uh, the Ockenden report related to um, maternity services in uh, Shropshire. So over a year ago, various people were dismissed or, or put on suspension, uh, leaders uh, put on leave uh, in April 2021. And the report has just come out for Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust. And one of the key findings was the failure in governance and leadership, partly because there was constant churn and change amongst the very senior level of the board level. The culture, the environment was not a positive one that encouraged learning and service improvement. Um, and there are issues within the workforce because of this, um, this leadership issue. So I guess this Ockerton report will be very much um, in the minds of policymakers and leaders, particularly obviously in maternity services going forward. So my first section is to look at systems. What is a system? What does it mean? And how do we manage to operate within the very complex systems we will work in? So Saltman in this OECD um, and colleagues over 10 years ago now said that health services can be characterized as modern society's most complex system. So we're working in hugely complex um, organizations and how on earth do we make sense of that from individual and team perspectives and actually be in positions to make a difference as leaders. And then very specifically, we have this policy push in the NHS for integration, integrating healthcare systems um, for effective clinical and care professional leadership. And very shortly, the messenger report on leadership in health and social care is due. So these very important guiding principles within the ICS policy um, very much focused on leadership development for all clinical and care professionals at all levels, as well as um, identifying, recruiting and creating a succession, um, a pipeline for future uh, professional leaders in clinical and care positions. So uh, Peter Senge at MIT is quite, uh, gives us quite useful perspectives on what is a system. Uh, so this is over 30 years old, it's quite useful to think of what, what do, do we mean by a system? And you're very familiar as healthcare practitioners of the human body as a system. Um, you change one part of the system and it may obviously impact another part. So he's defined a system as a whole system, as having various components, various elements that should hang together somehow. They should interact. So you may be a specialist in one area, but you also need to see the bigger picture of the organizational system, because inevitably um, there will be knock-on effects. If you close one part of the system, you expand, you invest, you make changes in one element over time um, that will have impact on other bits. And if we have a grand strategy within the NHS or within your particular unit, your department, your team, you need to be sure that you're working towards that common purpose of organizational strategy or team strategy um, while you're also developing the individual components. So he wrote this famous book um, and a practical book, uh, a field book called the Fifth Discipline Field Book, where it's very sort of practical strategies and tools to develop um, a learning organization that you can see here. So it's all about systems thinking and integration. And it's at various levels. So it's at the individual level of you developing your personal mastery. So clearly in, in Shropshire and Kent, where there have been problems with maternity services, people were just not sufficiently trained 
or confident to speak up or people were not trained to listen. Um, the paradigm, the mental models in people's heads was it's like, well, we, we're not allowed to um, say what we think or question practices or something was clearly going wrong um, in the paradigm there. And the shared vision was not, um, there may have been a formal strategy, but on the ground, it was not being um, implemented, avoiding um, cesarean C-sections and so on. If that was a particular policy on the ground, that's not necessarily matching the guidelines in the wider system. And teams were just not learning or they were learning to misbehave and follow bad practices. So it's very much about behaviors, how people interact with each other, linkages between different components, and very importantly, as I said, relationships between people, but also relationships between various bits of, of the organization. And then going on specifically to healthcare, looking at the World Health Organization report 2009 here, but I think this is still very relevant, what are the characteristics of systems? So they're often very much self-organizing. They're constantly dynamically changing, but they are closely linked. Um, feedback is hugely important. Uh, often things happen in a non-linear way. There may be cycles, two steps forward, three steps back. You have to consider history. You can't just look to the future, uh, learn from the past. Sometimes you find things that are counterintuitive, myths, about how to treat certain maybe uh, clinical uh, conditions, but also um, organizational conditions. And people are resistant to change. We are, we are creatures of habits and routines and moving systems forward, getting systems change requires a lot of political influencing, uh, inspiring leadership um, to convince people that change is needed or elements of change are needed in behaviors and that what we're moving towards is more attractive than perhaps the current situation. If people are exhausted um, because of the pandemic, maybe they just don't have the energy. So again, some more definitions of what is a healthcare system. Um, so I guess this is stating the obvious, perhaps another WHO report all activities whose primary purpose is to promote, restore, and maintain health. Um, that made more financial considerations and constraints. And then Roma does actually mention um, the issue of financing. So it's the combination of resources, the organization, financing, and management that culminate in the delivery of health services to the wider population. And I'd just like to touch on this example um, that's quite famous um, of systems change that didn't go right. So very well-meaning um, rather a long time ago in the 50s, but how actually tweaking the system actually caused more deaths and more problems. So there's this um, children's book actually uh, with these funny pictures on it of cats parachuting. Um, and there's a serious journal article about DDT and malaria called Parachuting Cats and Crushed Eggs. So if we look at this case study of uh, the controversy over the use of DDT to control malaria. So in the 50s, there was an outbreak of a serious disease, malaria, um, among a particular tribe, the Dayak people in Borneo. And the WHO thought it had the answer to this problem. And the answer was to spray the whole area with this clearly very dangerous chemical DDT to kill the mosquitoes. So success on one level in the system, the mosquitoes were killed and fewer people were dying of malaria. So far, so good. Unfortunately, there were side effects. So one of these, were that the roofs of people's houses fell in on their heads because um, the caterpillars were eating the roofs. So the parasitic wasps that ate the caterpillars that kept the roofs up um, were also killed by the DDT. So not just the mosquitoes, but the wasps. Um, so the thatch eating caterpillars proliferated 
Um, and the insects that died from being poisoned were eaten by the lizards who were subsequently eaten by the cats and the cats died. Whereupon the, flat, the rats did not die, they kept going. And there were other clearly um, significant uh, medical issues with people dying uh, from uh, typhus and sylvatic plague. So to try and solve the problem that they had created, they parachuted in yet more cats. So I guess that's a pretty obvious, uh, you know, story. We might have uh, envisaged that if we'd had local knowledge and uh, ask maybe um, local people and understood the wider system, not just that it was a very simplistic approach. We're going to come in as uh, experts in um, killing mosquitoes, we didn't have an appreciation of what was going on other components um, in this particular uh, scenario. So to zoom back out again, I just want to look at kind of going from a particular bit of Borneo um, to Mark Britnell's uh, work on the perfect health system. He wrote this book in 2015 and he's one of our honorary professors and executives in re res residence at University College London. So he chose the best bits of different healthcare systems um, around the world. And this is what he came up with. So in terms of values and access to universal healthcare, the UK is doing pretty well. Uh, primary care, Israelis, um, he was very impressed by that. Community services in Brazil, support for mental health and well-being uh, in Australia, the Nordic countries, he found excellent examples of health promotion and in parts of Africa, uh, engagement with patients and local communities and empowering them. And then moving over to the USA, uh, R&D, he found very strong. Looking at India, innovation, flair and speed were characteristics he admired. Then moving to Singapore, very small nation state, very easy to manage in some ways. So not unsurprisingly, information communications and technology are very impressive, which clearly is difficult to operate in other parts of the world. In France, he found uh, a choice as a very important part of the healthcare system. In Switzerland, funding and in Japan, where obviously there are considerable issues of aging populations, uh, looking after the aged aged care uh, provided exemplary examples for, for us to look at. So although that book is um, seven years, published seven years ago, um, you may dip into that to look at various systems around the globe that may inspire you that maybe you can import some of the ideas uh, from those systems, although of course the contexts are very different because uh, between the book being published and now uh, clearly the pandemic has changed systems uh, and challenged everyone uh, with innovations um, and different views of the world. And I guess it's very important, we are part of um, natural ecosystems too. Um, so the solutions are not just to be found within the human kind and our own ideas, but clearly in, in the natural world too, and the urban spaces that we're living in. And climate change is clearly a very important uh, factor in healthcare systems more broadly, which is another UN Sustainable Development Goal, looking at emergency climate change. So we do have tools in business schools that can help you make sense um, in offering the MBA Health at University College London, we're very much bringing business management um, theories and practices together with healthcare, with lots of case studies on the healthcare, which I guess isn't necessarily part of the curriculum um, if you're following dentistry or, or, or medical um, <laughs> curriculum as an undergraduate. So Checkland um, talked very much about soft systems methodology, SSM, so it's not just taking apart a system as you might a car mechanic or a jumbo jet engineer and just saying, you know, we've got this Boeing engine and uh, let's look at the system. Clearly patients, um, there are human actors within the systems 
in healthcare systems. So he also looked very closely at social rules, the norms, the cultures, the practices of the actors, of the participants in a system. So co-production with patients, um, co-production with local communities, um, community participatory action research, I think is very popular at the moment. So what is going on with you in your particular culture where you are operating in the world? Operating in the north of England, in China, clearly there are cultural norms, India, different ways of doing things, and clearly political systems. So he came up with this framework of look of cat woe. So who is the customer? It might not be the patient, it might be the sponsor, the donor, the politician, uh, who are the key actors who can make decisions. So you may have this brilliant product as an entrepreneur, um, but you need to develop relationships, um, friendships, uh, partnerships um, to get your brilliant product through. So the, someone was talking to me the other day about um, an antibiotic that was developed, a great antibiotic, but um, the antibiotics with anti -micro antibiotic uh, microbial resistance should be used sparingly. So how on earth do you create a blindingly brilliant drug that people should only use for firefighting? Um, what are the incentives in the system to encourage that? Um, and this company went bust because although it had a great product, um, you know, there weren't incentives, or there wasn't the marketization or the political will um, to support that company. So how do you bring about transformation, uh, wider changes? Um, when people have different worldviews, you're working with digital natives, you're working with more conservative people who don't have the digital skills, who's actually owning the problem, how do you convince them to change their everyday practices within very challenging um, physical, political, climate, different environments and contexts. So there are some tools when you can just start to simplify things, try and simplify things and unpack. So for instance, the systems map on the left, it's like who is in the system and who is outside the system um, is one question you, you might ask. And then, you know, who's in my team or, or what teams are we talking about? Um, so doing some very simple snapshot like this of where we are and where we might like to be um, can at least kind of on a two dimensional level, help you um, make sense of who are the key stakeholders um, in and outside the boundaries, uh, however you want to plot them. And then there's this other uh, stakeholder map where you look at who the really important stakeholders in terms of their interest in your change management project or your system and how you might influence them. Um, so is it trade unions? Is it the the director of nursing? Um, is it the CEO of my acute hospital trust? Um, and you can map them. So you can take the various players on the left and on the bottom left here on the stakeholder map, you can say, well, actually, I really don't need to talk to that person terribly much. They're not gonna snooker my project, um, my change project. Um, they're not terribly influential. They're not terribly interested in what I'm doing. They're not gonna resist. Or, so you can put them in that box there. But the people on the top right, they're highly influential. They could make or break your change within the system. And uh, you do need to have regular dialogue and conversations with them. And other people you just keep satisfied or you keep informed. Um, so hopefully those kind of tools you're using um, to help you make sense of the world and to give you that bigger picture um, because you may be working very hard for instance, on this issue of silence, you know, we need to talk about this issue a lot. Every meeting you have with people, formally and informally, you try and break that silence. On the other hand, there may be something else going on, denial, clearly, in the Ockerden report. People aren't trained, they're ignorant. Um, there may be other parts of the elephant that you're not seeing, which is so important why you need to stand back. Um, there's this um, saying, that when a tiger pounces, it first of all takes a step back. And I think it's very important, we're very busy, you need to stand back and reflect and see the bigger picture. And then you can hone in far on our particular aspects of what you think needs sorting out in terms of your elephant that you're trying to deal with, bite, bite size, chunk, bite, chunk. 
Okay, so I've been talking for far too long, so I'm going to stop my share for now. And um, please do, if you'd like to ask any questions, please write in the box for the Q&A. Give you a couple of minutes to write something. Any at the moment. So we have 25 attendees. So Utik, Ayat, Bhagav, Elizabeth, Cuban, Sudhir, please feel free, Joe, Kalai, any comments would be very gratefully received. Sandeep, Regine, Raphael. Oliver, Solomon, Tabasum, Wendy. I think Wendy's coming in from Harvard. Okay, it's all quiet here at the moment. So while I'm talking in the next round, um, please feel free to uh, write in the Q&A. Um, okay, so let me go back to sharing the screen. Can find it from the elephant. So the next bit. Um, one more for me. The next bit is about leadership. Um, so clearly we've seen in the Ockerden report, there were leaders that very highly paid leaders um, and collectively on the board of the, this hospital trust, but clearly something was going wrong. Um, so there are clearly thousands of definitions of leadership. And here's an example um, from the leadership quarterly Leadership is about ensuring direction, alignment, and commitment. So DAC, this framework they've come up with. So we know where we're heading, some kind of sense of horizon. We have a vision of the future. Um, we're trying to bring people together. People may be going off at different tangents. They have different disciplines, different functions, different specialisms. We're trying to create some kind of common purpose and commitment. So people feel emotionally invested and they believe in what we're doing. You know, it's kind of internalized, they're not just doing their work here for the money to achieve the NHS goals or wherever you are in the world, uh, whatever public or private or other sec sector you're in. Um, so it, I guess it's very important for your CPD, for your continual professional development, that you are critical and you sort of question um, these concepts. So as I said earlier, what is missing for me, it doesn't really say anything about relationships, how people interact. It doesn't really say anything about morality. You could have said um, at this, where this maternity services were going wrong, um, they did have a sense of direction. It was like reduce as many possible C-sections. Um, there did seem to be alignment. People were kind of going with that particular flow um, and people were, employed there, they were sticking with the organization. It wasn't like everybody left. Um, so they were, had unethical practices. Uh, clearly people weren't listening to each other. The relationships were subpar. They certainly weren't learning. They weren't learning the basic skills of midwifery, it seems, or learning from mistakes or the big data or the statistics that, that they had. And processes and systems weren't in place within that particular uh, geographical context. And I think things had happened in the south, south of England too, in Kent. So they weren't learning, they weren't seeing the bigger picture and somehow um, leadership was failing. So that uh, definition perhaps doesn't capture the whole of what we're really talking about leadership. And leadership very much today is about shared leadership, distributed leadership, 
not about heroic leaders, but we still do need individuals, uh, leaders to take responsibility. And clearly at, that can be at any level, formal or informal. So I think this Social Care Institute for Excellence definition is more helpful in some respects. So this is more recent. And this talks about systems leadership in terms of building relationships, as I said, senior, junior, all levels. Uh, it's about connections, nodes, um, linkages across different disciplines, across different jobs and multidisciplinary teams, and across different organizations more broadly within ICS and sectors, private, public, social, enterprise, entrepreneurs, to drive improvement, uh, so not to accept the status quo, innovation, so this, that's actually generating good ideas and being imaginative, but also implementing them and transforming the services that we're in. And that doesn't mean to say transforming things for the sake of things, if things are working well, um, that's fine, but always looking for ways to change because society is changing and we're all, we're all in a dynamic system. So they've listed various effective systems leadership that I'm sure we're seeing in the media uh, very recently did not happen. Um, and the Ockerden report ex explains in more detail. So the idea of shared participatory, diffused and co-productive, we're all in it together. Whatever our pay scales, uh, we should be able to uh, share our thoughts and give feedback to each other. Very much about person-centered, personal relationship building. It's not just, sorry, it's not my job. Um, we're all in it together and we're all here to make uh, it a better workplace as well as a safer um, improving patient care. Um, geography does matter, although it's very much a digital age, um, place does matter. And clearly the reputation of this particular hospital is very seriously tarnished in the Ockerden report. And we have to build a sense of community engagement um, I guess where, where small hospitals, community, uh, country, rural hospitals have really had a more benefit from that culture. We have to be adaptive. We have to change um, with circumstances and be solution focused, but not to the extent that we just think we're going to kill the um, mosquitoes. We have to look more broadly than that. And somehow um, conflict was just suppressed in the Ockerden report that we saw. So how do we surface conflict, dissent, disharmony for constructive purposes and to build sort of shared consensus and belief in what we're doing? And finally, obviously we need accountability um, to each other, uh, to the board and to, uh, trustees or whatever you're working with in a hospice or different sectors and to the communities in which we operate. So I think that is a more reassuring definition, perhaps, than the um, 2008 definition, which is a very general one in the leadership quarterly there. And it's a very useful article uh, published last year. What does success look like for leaders um, in this ICS system that we're working towards integrating health and social care systems? a realist perspective. So it's all very well having these reports of how normative approach, how things should be, but clearly when we're on the ground, it's very different. So they interviewed people who are already working in ICS. Um, so I think they've echoed on the ground, you know, it is very important, the sense of working together, creating the right hotspots. Linda Grattan at London Business School talks about hotspots and blue freezes. As a leader, you have to facilitate systems and conditions where people will work together and be energized um, and feel warm about their organization and, and work purposefully and, and effectively. You have to be aware of people who are different from you. And it's very valuable to keep us in check, but put yourself in other people's shoes. You do have to understand the politics and the limited resources and the power structures. Take a broader view and be very committed to learning and development thing and try to understand the complexity. And certainly compared with the higher education system, I'm very impressed by what I see when I do go into um, healthcare systems, very strong 
elements of this that I think other systems could learn from. So those are the key findings from that, that article um, on what success does look like. So you can look at that article if you want to look at the practical examples. And uh, GBS, I'm um, interviewing our various chief executives and other players in the healthcare system. So last week on our YouTube, I interviewed um, David Probert, who's the CEO of um, UCLH NHS Hospital Trust. So he's, he leads uh, five hospitals. But there's this book that was quite interesting, uh, being an NHS chief executive, what they never told me, or if they did, I wasn't listening. So Lisa Rodriguez has given some insights into what keeps her awake at night, or certainly when she, um, she was in this role. So Drucker, Peter Drucker famously always said this, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you may have a great strategic plan, but if the culture is not supporting that, um, you know, you're not going anywhere. So she emphasized that you have to get the right feel and climate within the organization. And that was a real issue um, in the Ockerton report that was highlighted. You have to look after yourself. I'm sure as healthcare professionals, you know this, we know this, but we don't necessarily do it. Self-care has to come before caring for others, was another insight. And you've constantly, as you've seen in that survey and some of the negative press um, amongst all the fantastic things people are doing in the healthcare sector, the media, 24 seven media and social media have this rhetoric that's very anti the public sector sometimes. Um, fake news, post-fact world, um, and that's pretty brutal. Um, talking to recently about dentists, worrying about that, how many Instagram followers they have. Um, people want to be liked, but on the other hand, when things turn to trolls, that's very unpleasant. And in leadership positions, any leadership position can be very lonely because sometimes you have ideas that you're not prepared to share yet with others that um, maybe you have to keep to yourself or you can share with your partners or your confidence or a coach. Um, so people in get in touch to congratulate you when something goes well, but when things go wrong, people you thought were your friends disappear. So how do you guard against that practically to make sure you're not derailed by the few things that do go wrong amongst all the good things that happen? And in any seniorship position, you don't have time to think. So in the same way as point two about protecting yourself physically, mentally, uh, socially, um, and so on, how do you actually make sure you're a reflective practitioner? How do you make sure that you're just not constantly doing, 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 and as Donald Schoen says, you know, you, you need deliberative, reflective practices. Do you reflect commuting in the bath on an app? Uh, when do you find time to do this? Do you build in reflection and feedback in meetings at the end of a, a, of a shift? How do you make sure you have time to think and not just do? And she also makes the point that, you know, it's getting harder and harder to fill senior vacancies. And there was an MA, um, a World Health Organization report a few years ago about healthcare systems being delivered by women, but led by men. So how do we make sure we have enough senior leaders and that we have the uh, diversity amongst them? So I hope you find that useful. And then going back to um, some research, the World Economic Forum wrote this report a couple of years ago on systems leadership. Um, so at Davos, they discussed, you know, what can people practically do on the ground to make sense of systemic um, systems led leadership. So they use this definition, systems leaders are able to catalyze and empower collective action, among others, rather than just telling people what to do, rather than just controlling people or putting all the onus on themselves to get things done. Um, so you've got this Venn diagram here of the system. We know already we're working very complex systems. So how do you gain insights into mapping out the system? How do you build this sense of community? So you've got advocates on the ground, tacticians who can help uh, drive small wins and the general direction that you would like to make change in consultation with them. And how do you ensure this is all very collaborative and you have the right set of skills 
um, to be a systems leader. So they had various quotes from people, you know, here we are in this VUCA, this very volatile, uncertain environment uh, where maybe nobody is in charge really um, in practice. So no one's in control, people were saying. There is no single authority who's in charge of the whole system. Um, number two, people were saying, well, actually, you know, if we look at climate change or any of these big systems, if we try to try and make some impact, you know, we have to make personal changes ourselves as part of the system. And then, as we said, everything's connected. So you make one change and some people like it, other people hate it, you know. Um, but hopefully you're learning as you do. Hopefully you do get some sense. I think if we have big, big, big goals like the sustainable development goals, these grand challenges, at least in principle, people can see the kind of direction we're going in. Um, but by getting buy-in is very difficult. Um, and inevitably there are setbacks in innovating and collaborating. But one person, organization, or small group can have a significant impact. I think that was a general message. You clearly, need to have some kind of coordination, uh, formal coordination, some communication um, and celebration to keep momentum of successes. And it is a marathon and not a sprint. So, those are some of the quotes um, that people gave in response to this framework that was developed, this clear framework um, to try and make sense of systems change. So you've got these five elements in this model. People convene, they get together and they commit to making some kind of change, looking and learning what's going on, um, engaging and energizing people, patients, communities, making sure there's good governance, accountability and ethical behaviors, and then constantly reviewing and revising and going around this framework. And they're given some useful questions. So how on earth do you actually make sense on the ground of this model at a personal level? So questions like, have we sufficiently engaged the right stakeholders to join our discussion? If you're talking to people who look like you, maybe not. Um, so how do you expand your networks to make sure you are getting the right relevant stakeholders? Um, are you committed um, to moving forward this issue of shared concern? Have you built up evidence of the case for, for making a difference? Make Look seems to be repeated the first one. Have we identified all the stakeholders relevant? So do you have a steering group, advisory board, people on board? And how will you gain evidence and keep learning um, through interactions or non-interactions in this system about behavioral um, relationships approach? Are you getting buy-in? People may have different buttons and levers to press from these different stakeholders. So that stakeholder mapping is useful. And energy, actually people are exhausted um, in healthcare. How do you actually, they may think it's a great idea, but how do you add that extra element as a leader um, in getting um, inspiration and commitment on these ambitions? How do you make sure you're not um, gonna end up parachuting cats to sort out your rat problem, that you've uh, generated a problem that wasn't already there? So how do you bring in new ideas, get innovation and strengthen that? How do you make sure there are people who are accountable really review and revise and keep learning with various measures and dissemination of your impact and your results. I quite like Simon Weston, who has a kind of historical view of leadership. And I guess what uh, the model I've just shown you is a kind of eco leader that he calls someone who kind of sees the bigger picture and has concerns um, from not just perhaps what was current in the uh, 20th century of the leader as a controller or just scientific management at the Ford Motor Factory or maybe what we're seeing at Foxconn still in some parts of the world where people are just controlled like robots. Um, there is a sense of humanity, the kind of human relations approach um, that is kind of got launched in the 60s 
but we're not um, succumbing to this kind of messianic evangelical leader who's out there who will tell us what to do and give us you know great um, great visions um, and then when they're sacrificed on the altar of failure uh, we don't know what to do we kind of you know don't behave as good followers um, we just leave it all to the leader so there have been there clearly are lots of fashions in the leadership literature and um, at the moment it's all about collective shared um, we're all responsible we're all in it together and I think this chimes very much with what I'm talking about today the systems approach um, so working across boundaries realizing it's uh, very complicated um, you may have the walls of your acute hospital but clearly the social care other systems primary care outside your acute hospital you're not very aware of the external environment and we need to create spaces to think to break down silos to communicate and connect not just on twitter likes and linkedin but actually genuine dialogue and conversations where we can get useful feedback and then evaluate the value of that feedback to see whether we need to continue to adapt so it's very much about distributed leadership clearly there's lots of political environmental factors going on in the context um, we have to recognize you know we are interdependent we're all in this together and we need to weigh up priorities um, in various ways and there will be inevitably resistance and criticism of change within the systems leadership um, and ultimately you know we need to do things responsibly um, and sustainably um, mindful of ethics continuity and change all of which are contested so the nhs leadership academy there are masses of courses online available of course there's plenty of content out there for how we actually internalize this in our own behaviors the knowing doing gap which um i think the mba programs um bridge that kind of doing um doing with um actually knowing so these are all very laudable clearly we want to inspire with a shared sense of purpose lead with care evaluate information connect services share the vision engage the team hold people to account develop capability and influence for results um, but how do we do that practically when we're very busy um, the easiest thing for some managers is to adopt this seagull management approach you just drop things to do and delegate uh, to other people if you're in a senior position and michael west at lancaster with the faculty of medical <clears throat> leadership and management has come up with um, a useful report looking at a literature review um, again there are plenty of reports around of what makes effective health service leaders it's kind of at an individual level um, and i did research on Airedale Hospital myself in the Yorkshire Dales and following the Twitter feed of one of the advanced clinical practitioners in um, in the emergency department actually showed some of this quite literally to me you know constantly emphasizing safety targets how well they were doing and dealing with um, tremendous pressure so dealing with compassion clearly is a very important part of the NHS long-term plan for patients and for employees and just walking around this hospital every time I visited, there were clearly signposts, there were posters um, physically showing how many trips and falls they'd had that month and how they were meeting targets and celebrating um, issues related to safety, quality and care. Issues of fairness, um, participation, involvement, staff voice. So I'll mention later a uh, Schwartz round. So they introduced Schwartz rounds where people could talk about how they feel in their roles in healthcare. Very positive, upbeat environment, newly qualified nurses bringing them in and making sure that they kept up their spirits on long shifts and uh, moving over from supernumerary to mainly being on the rotors, huge shock for um, newly qualified nurses. Issues of transparency, um, dealing with poor performance, and the sense of co we're continually developing and innovating. So I think we're already starting to see with these slides, you know, common themes coming out. And I think as a professional, 
when you've had a really bad day, someone's been rude to you, you're thinking, oh my gosh, why am I here? What's going on? Reminding yourself that you are a professional and there are professional standards. And uh, these kind of themes, I think is very important. You know, you're not just dealing with things that, on a personal level, but you are a qualified professional in a system where there are huge difficulties in the system and things don't work as the books and articles and reports say they should, but ultimately those are the kind of behaviours we're expecting. Okay, so in line with the title, I just want to move on to the other bit about hybrid professionals. So my PhD was looking at business school deans. Um, at Warwick Business School particularly, I looked at all the deans of the business school, and a lot of them had been management consultants, actually. They hadn't spent all their lives in academia but they were top scholars. So they, they were top scholars as well as executives, which can be a very difficult position to be in. So, you know, where is your allegiance? Is it to your strategic management professor colleagues, or is it to the business school, or is it to the, um, the university strategy, which may be different from what's going on in the business school world? So Louise Fitzgerald at Oxford and Ewan Furley at King's College London have this definition generally of what hybrids are, and they do focus quite a lot on the healthcare profession. So hybrids are persons from a particular profession who are now managing professional colleagues and other staff. So you may be a medical doctor, you may be a particular specialty, oncologist, radiologist, you may be a dentist, a nurse, a clinician, but you're managing a multidisciplinary team. You may be a CEO of a hospital, but you're actually, your degrees in history. So how do you stay legitimate, um, perhaps as a clinical professional? You know, you, you do know what's going on within your clinical area, you're a medical director or whatever, uh, but you do also understand the business side of the organization. And you can, see the bigger picture. So if someone wants a particularly expensive drug and you, you know what the finances of the hospital are and the repercussions, if you go down a particular clinical route, what are the wider, wider implications for the other bits of the clinical operations or other parts of the hospital? So on the one hand, my view is like mongrel dogs in a sense. They're often healthier live longer and stronger than purebreds where they've had various diseases uh, inbred. Um, so in one sense, blended professionals are where you should be. You know, if you have an MD, MBA, isn't that fantastic? Because you can speak the language of clinicians, but you can also speak the language of executives. So when your chief executive, who may not be a clinician, talks to you, you can speak their language or the finance director's language or the policymaker's language. So I often talk about Sir Patrick Valance, who um, works as a consultant in the NHS, a medic. He was um, an academic at University College London. He was head of the medical school. Then he went to work for um, GSK as head of drug discovery. He was on the board of Glaxo with lots of shares. And then he became um, he worked for the government during the pandemic and currently still is working for the government. But someone's Kate Bingham, who was head of the um, vaccine task force, said Patrick was brilliant. We wouldn't have got the vaccine through so quickly in England if it hadn't been for Patrick Valance, because he could speak multiple languages. He could talk to the big farmer. He could talk to the civil servants and Boris Johnson. Um, he could speak, he was one of, He's one of these guys who can cross various boundaries, one of these hybrid leaders, one of these individuals who can speak multiple languages and drive um, strategy forward. So in some ways, these hybrid managers are in a fantastic position um, to, to drive forward change. As long as the caveat is, that they, are, they have credibility, at least historical credibility and perhaps current credibility in their primary profession. They know what's going on. So Patrick is still a medic. Um, 
while they move over to kind of the other side in terms of being on boards and being in very senior leadership positions. So they maintain credibility in different camps. So Fitzgerald and Furley argue um, that these advantages are lost if the professional gives up the professional practice because they can quickly become out of date, distance from their colleagues and worse, they seem to have kind of gone over to the dark side. You know, you're not looking out for the clinicians anymore. You're just in Boris Johnson's pocket. So that's what we mean by hybrid professionals. They can translate. Um, so here are some articles that talk about the role of professional elites in healthcare governance, the role of the medical director. And uh, Martin Kitchener at Cardiff Business School talks about clinical directors in the UK hospital system. So they talk about medical directors being able to influence quality because they can translate, they can interpret between different worlds. Often they have these diplomatic skills that can repair relationships between different factions. People with different disciplines who may have different priorities and different views of the world. There was some discussion about medical directors as regional political elites who can deal with front stage PR and so on, uh, public speaking, but also backstage politicking and negotiations. Some medical directors are corporate elites aligned with organizational interests, um, was one finding. Clearly, you do want to advance your organization as well as your own specialism. And service change has enduring emotional effects that can negatively affect quality. So they brought up this issue of emotional intelligence. Um, so it's not just a matter of being very knowledgeable, but you also need to engage people emotionally. So it's not just about having a very good business case or cognition, um, but it's about hearts and minds. And it can backfire negatively. And I guess um, the MD, MBA is very popular, particularly in the US. You know, what is going on in this green bit where you've got your clinical skills and your management skills? working in practice so that you don't you know go make things worse i guess on these levels so there's a couple of articles that you might find useful and um snowden wrote this hbr article a while ago looking at um what is complex and what is complicated so a swiss watch may be very complicated um but a forest is complex so the issue about the forest or uh, the healthcare system um, is organizational systems and then living systems. Um, so mayonnaise, you was talking about as complex because it can go off, you know, bits of the mayonnaise interact, but actually a jumbo jet, um, Snowden and Boom talked about jumbo jet being actually as complicated because um, most of the time things are fairly set. Um, so there are various Senefin model that he came up with dealing with uh, complexity and making decisions in this in this predicament and clearly we've seen plenty of leaders making the wrong simple decisions um, because the right decisions are just too difficult to make um, and there are various ways that universities can help and various processes for instance, design thinking, where you can map out with consultants and other people. Um, this is an example from Stanford, executive education, various processes of ideation, prototyping, testing, when you do have innovations. Um, other, other, other models you can use like rich pictures. So here's an example uh, from healthcare using soft systems methodology we mentioned earlier. So again, um, Rich pictures, ideally with rich pictures, you don't use many words, you just use lots of pictures. But if you are very visual, um, you can do this electronically. Um, they've added here quite a few words actually and lots of questions, but they've got the various actors in the organization and then the various goings on outside. So inside, um, what's the evidence behind this guideline, this medic is asking, this guideline doesn't apply to my patients. Someone is asking about clinician autonomy. You know, I've always done it this way. I can't perform the guideline recommendation in my circumstances. It seems to be five o'clock, so people are rushing off. How can I keep up with all the new evidence? I'm just overloaded. So these are the kinds of thought bubbles within. And then these 
other things going outside. It's plenty of R and D, funding issues. You've got issues of patients getting frustrated, older patients with multiple comorbidities, and the press watching everything you do. Um, so just a simple rich picture, and then you can start to play with it and looking at weightings and and various arrows. What's going on? And another example here, um, looking at bound, trying to make boundaries. So this is an example, an analytical model for healthcare systems analysis and two case studies. So here you've got um, examples in India uh, of obstacles in delivering chronic disease care within a particular local healthcare system. So on the left, you've kind of got the general model and then here on the right, they've, they've populated it with examples. I haven't quite stated the goal there, but at the moment they've got poor quality of care at the level of primary health care. Services are not affordable. Um, and one in four families with PWCD incur catastrophic expenditure from ambulatory care alone. So this can help you unpick um, how do we change the leadership and governance? Clearly there's an issue here regulating the private sector, integration, uh, limited resources, you've got issues of service delivery that's fragmented, so how do you integrate that? And then the population, do you not, can, you, can you educate, communicate better with the population? They're just, patients are passive. Well, how do you get patients to be more interactive in kind of co-production? So hopefully, if you, if you are involved in these kind of projects, you can use some of these tools and um, some of these templates that can help you make sense of your own world um, in a very, very tiny way. Okay, so I'm gonna just break again to see if anyone would like to say anything in the chat. If you're happy to munch through your lunch and for me to continue talking. Oh, we have some questions. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so Joe has asked lots of challenges that are felt in real time, useful framework. How do non-hierarchical systems fit in this and in the UK? So I guess, Joe, you raise a very interesting question because uh, we were talking about, oh, isn't it nice to be collaborative and non-hierarchical and informal leadership, which kind of is a recipe for chaos. Um, but you may be working in systems that are very hierarchical and that may be easier in some ways um, because you can just tell people what to do. So I think I should get you to answer your own question, Joe, really, but I think partially my answer is it's about hearts and minds. Um, it's about talking with people, engaging with people, knowing people's names and uh, finding out what they want. Um, so it's a process. Um, that is two-way. So when you don't have hierarchies, I agree. Um, maybe it was easier in the day when, you know, doctors were in the elite hierarchy and um, other people did what doctors told them to do, but that's a very poor model because it isn't necessarily the dominant professions or the minority elites uh, actually know um, so I think through dialogue and engagement. Um, there are lots of leaders across the ICS. How do leaders ensure discussions, decision-making and action is integrated? Not everyone may be invited to the table. Um, so I guess it's interesting you talk about the table. So I guess we have this very formal table who's actually at the boardroom table, who, who's actually in meetings, but then there may be corridor conversations, informal opportunities to talk to people. There may be other means through social media, through um, talking perhaps to younger people, people who are working in the community more remotely. Certainly we have this issue, I'm a trustee of a hospice, um, not everybody reads their email daily. Um, maybe some people use text messaging. So how can you get ambassadors, champions in the field or, or, or 
you're not you know directly within your sphere of influence that you can get feedback from in multiple communications channels i think and it's all about inclusivity how do you how do you make sure you have inclusion and you're not just talking to the usual suspects um, so that is a constant ongoing dynamic i think that's a very good question for you to be aware of communications is absolutely critical in discussions and decision making and actions because if people haven't been involved at the discussion stage i mean designing um, the changes uh, they may you know be not at all happy with the action stage so i think that's very important um, if there is no time to think, is there a patient safety issue? Um, I would say absolutely, Jane. Um, if you have no time to reflect, to step back, and I know, you know, sometimes I have constant Zoom meetings, it's like, where did the day go? I can't even, what the heck happened that day? Um, it's very dangerous. And I always remember that one of the previous uh, governors of the Bank of England saying, I. I'm in a very serious job as governor of the Bank of England. As much as possible, I don't have meetings in the morning, which is kind of very, very nice for some people, but, but that's time to think. I read papers, I write papers. Um, I don't care how many meetings I have in the afternoon or social events in the evening. And I think there are tools, there are various apps where you can actually write things down, you know, kind of five minutes even every day or you build in somehow, or even in your conversations, you have coaching conversations. It's like, well, you know what happened today how could we do better um somehow you've got to build this in for your cpd when you're commuting to work when you're going to the bathroom when you're having a break to eat um somehow you think well could i have done better somehow i always remember um someone who worked for a consulting firm and she went to work as head of the public records office one of her colleagues said She's desperate for feedback. Every time we have a meeting, we do a pitch. She says, how did I do? How did I do? How could we do better? And um, that's what she got in management consultant. Every time they did something, they say, right, maybe you could have done that differently next time. So I'm thinking of our session today. You know, next time I do a session like this, I will open it out so you can talk to me and you can write in the chat because I want it more interactive. So hopefully, you know, there are mechanisms that aren't too onerous that, um, even just said, how are we doing today? Is there anything we could have done differently? Or what do you think um, that you can capture that time to think and reflection? So thank you for that, Jane. Okay, Jing Chong Lu, I have three questions here. Is it necessary to have only one leader in a group? Um, so I think everybody personally, this is very idealistic, everybody can be a leader from the janitor there are these famous quotes that JFK went to um, NASA and he asked someone who was mopping the floor, what do you do? And the reply was, I send people to the moon. I contribute to sending people to the moon. And similarly at Rolls Royce, someone was just had the job of fixing the wipers on the car. And someone said, what's your job then? Isn't it a bit boring, you know, fixing wipers for the Rolls Royce? And he said, I make the best car in the world. Um, and people taking initiative, I think, you know, the parking, the receptionist, the per person in charge of the parking lot um, could be an informal leader. They may be better connected than actually the CEO on one level. Um, clearly, you don't want everyone taking charge every five minutes. You do need accountability and people are um, have to work to their, within their license, obviously clinical professionals. But I think you can have rotating leaders. You know, you're the expert today at this meeting, you chair the meeting. Tomorrow I'll chair the meeting because I know what I'm talking about or, or we, can, we can rotate. You certainly have that in academia. You used to, you know, you're, you're head of department for three years and then someone else is head of department for another three years, you pass it round. You can almost do that a minute by minute <coughs> level. Um, you may have co-leaders. Uh, Blackberry at one time had um, a CEO who was very tech based and someone was very marketing focused. So they had co-chairs. You do have some organizations that have co-CEOs. Um, so you may do that on a grander scale for a working group or a project 
as well as have deputy associate leaders. Um, but I think it should not, leadership is not just about pay or position. It's actually what you contribute um, and it's about behaviors and relationships. So I don't think you necessarily have one leader unless you're in an absolute crisis. So <coughs> if um, we're on fire and um, you are a nominated leader and you say, get out, um, you know, it's quite okay for us to follow you and just follow the one leader. Um, Systems leadership involves diverse departments. Since each department contains its leadership style, how could the whole organization within these departments work effectively without conflict with each other? So my answer to that is that conflict is inevitable. Some of the worst situations I've been in are where there has been no conflict and where my boss only wants harmony. And people have been very nice, very quiet and very frustrated. So I do not necessarily see conflict as a bad thing, as long as it's handled constructively and, and uh, not attacking people individually. Um, we can talk about behaviors and how to be more professional, uh, but I think conflict is good. It's great to have diverse opinions, but they need to be channeled productively. And exactly, you know, there are kind of norms maybe you know the r d department is fighting with the sales department because the sales department promised things that r d can't deliver or human resources fighting with payroll because perhaps the same reasons payroll has particular deadlines and everything's quantitative and hr maybe is more developmental and human resource and od focused so inevitably you know we come from we have different biases personally professionally so i think leadership styles different leadership styles are inevitable and conflict is inevitable but it's how you look at the bigger picture and work constructively and collaboratively as we are seeing now nato trying to do so despite very very different origins and cultures and histories so so yeah some of the slides you've seen uh, give you advice on how to work constructively and i guess maybe um workshops on negotiation how to broaden the pie, um, have win-wins, at least some of the time is helpful. So there's this example, I went to Harvard Law uh, program on negotiation, and there's an example of a mother who's got a son and daughter fighting over an orange, and she just chops up the orange in half. And actually what happens is that the daughter throws away the middle of the orange because she only wants the peel, and the son um, eats the middle and throws away the peel. So actually suboptimal outcome was actually if she talked to them and found out that the, one of them wanted the peel and one of them wanted the innards, everybody could have had 100% of the negotiation uh, as a win-win. Um, so I, I guess some of the advice of talking to people, finding out what they want and what, what is kind of constructive for all sides um, within the constraints, severe constraints we have is very productive. And then the third question you've asked is, there was one component of potential leadership called strong power. Is there any example to support this statement? Um, so I'd have to find out for you what you mean by strong power, but clearly we've seen Putin, very strong leader. Um, we've seen, I guess, strong leaders in the pandemic who've made very good decisions. We see strong leaders like uh, Jacinda Ardern in, um, in New Zealand, people talk very positively about her, although certainly before the pandemic, we see in Ukraine, um, Zelensky, we've said, probably saying nice things about him. Uh, so we do see strong leaders in situations where you do need strong leadership. So one of our outcomes I said at the beginning was critique. Shakespeare famously said, nothing is necessarily good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So depending on the situation, strong leadership is very needed or strong power. Um, I guess that's talking about, you know, Putin only understands strength. So you, you have to match his strong power with your strong power. On the other hand, we've all seen dictators where strong power has led to bad things happening. So contingency leadership, situational leadership, being very sensitive to the context um, and outcomes ethical outcomes 
Um, you may think that Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand is great for shutting the borders in New Zealand, but economically you could say maybe that's been a disaster. So public health, maybe it's been a big success, but mental health, as we know here with lockdowns, strong leadership, I like the malaria story, clearly has repercussions. So you have to be very sensitive to context and make very tricky decisions as we've seen as leaders. So thank you very much, Lou, for that. Um, I'm glad you dispute the idea, Jane, that patients are seen as passive. That's great. We don't want passive patients. We want well-informed patients, but we don't want them being too active and suing us. Um, clearly, um, we want joint conversations. Oh, wow. And then a couple more questions, a few more questions. Uh, Lou's giving me two more. Uh, should hybrid professional leaders be specialized in one specific area or subject? Um, so there's a lot of talk about T-shaped professionals. So, you know, you're very specialized, you're maybe an endodontist or something. Um, um, but it's also good to be a generalist to see an overview how your particular root canal um, specialism fits into both. So your question about um, should you be specialized? I think it's good to be an expert in something um, as well as, you know, have a general overview because then you can see how your specialism fits in to be known for something um, as well as see the wider systems context. Um, I think that does add to credibility. So if Sir Patrick Balance was struck off the General Medical Council register, it would look kind of a bit odd because we do respect him for being a medic as well, I guess. Not struck off, but you know, struck off because he decided not to renew his registration. And then in the healthcare industry, are there any differences in the hybrid professional leadership system between the government and the private sector? Um, so quite possibly, yeah. I mean, I guess in the private sector, maybe you need particular skills in finances, perhaps. In government, you need more expertise in policy. So I guess as a hybrid professional, if you're moving from being a hybrid professional in acute care, and then you become a hybrid professional in a management consulting operation, and then perhaps in a government department, I guess people are going to look at you differently um, in different contexts. So again, context really matters. And then finally, before we go on to a few more slides, um, a couple more questions. Mariam has a couple. I assume to make these models, we need data and information and transparency. How do we deal with lack of information and transparency to use these models in practice? Yeah, so I guess what I'm encouraging to, you to be is an insider researcher. So do you collect this information just by observation, anecdote, or is there someone in your organization who has big data, um, who has to collect data anyway for reporting purposes, or you can find a student or an MBA intern work with UCL um, to get people to help you get useful and relevant and accurate data and information to help you make the decisions. That's a very good point, Miriam. And then Shruti, you mentioned that it's becoming harder to find people to hold positions in senior management roles. As a young clinician at this stage who aspires to hold management positions in healthcare in the future, what would you advise me to do? Um, so come and join us at UCL, do the MBA in health or the EMBA online or, or MBA part-time. You're very welcome to do that. Um, but practically, yeah, we're seeing, I think Andrew Pettigrew gave a talk. He's, he was at Oxford at the British Academy and saying that, um, you know, how on earth can you do the job when there's a churn 18 months maybe in the job as a CEO? So uh, talking to um, our YouTube clip that we have with David Probert, who's head of University College London Hospitals NHS Trust, I asked him, you know, are you really gonna be here in 18 months time? And it's like, well, how on earth can you make change if you're only in the job for half an hour? Um, so that is a real challenge. So getting these positions, having a coach, a sponsor, um, networking, going to networking events, uh, who are the decision makers for, for appointing CEOs, clinicians, it's very important. So you're, I'll move on to some slides in a minute about networking. I think that's critical. 
um, getting yourself out there, getting yourself visible, testing your leadership skills, maybe going on a trustee of a of um, a hospice or a board is very useful board experience as well. And getting feedback from others um, and talking to people in these positions. I think that there have been a lot of retirements. There is a lot of movement. So there are a lot of opportunities for you to get these jobs. And clearly when you get them, you wanna stay in them. Um, so you wanna be successful in them. And I think it's a huge issue for all of us um, in many of these senior jobs we see in banking, in universities, you know, having people in these senior roles just for 18 months is not ideal. Um, so I hope that's answered your very interesting questions. So the final part is to move on to networking. Um, Martin Luther King, I came up with this quote, talked about us being caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This is the interrelated structure of reality. You can't just say, you know, isn't it fantastic? I'm an oligarch, I'm very rich. I can live in this penthouse in a gated community and I'm fine because we've all got to suffer climate change. Um, We've all got to be part of um, some kind of network that that purse, that oligarch needs dental treatment, they need uh, healthcare, they um, need to interact with others. I think in Brazil, it's very rich CEOs, you know, they, they go in helicopters to work so they're not hijacked in their cars or um, uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, you know, we're all part of the whole ultimately. And even within your own small um, team or operation or specialty, you know, networking is, is very important. Again, there's some quotes, uh, Ethiopian proverb, when spiders unite, they can tie up a lion. However kind of insignificant you might feel in your particular role or very constrained in terms of your agency, we are part of a wider network. And as we've seen in Ukraine, sometimes David can overcome Goliath um, with the support of others. Um, and in this, uh, there was a, a recent blog by Bevan and Hendricks, Hendricks um, in this School for Change uh, tweet. Um, again, reiterates what I've been trying to communicate all through this talk is that change is inherently relational. You know, we are interdependent. Um, so our ability to work with others to make things happen and to get you your senior job, um, your next position is quite critical. Um, so although we have lots of you know, formal systems, clearly to make sure that the right people are appointed to the right jobs and positions, who you know is as important as what you know. So we've got this cycles here. You may feel you're just one brick in the huge system, um, but changing yourself individually, you can, as we've seen with Greta Thunberg and others, you can mobilize collective and then systems level change. Again, from the natural world, um, we are linked clearly to the natural world to each other. And you can see with these um, starlings that they keep themselves safe by um, keeping together. So you've got systems within systems. And this quote from Capra, in nature, there is no above or nor below. It's kind of a non-hierarchical approach. There are only networks nestling within other networks. And this kind of web of life, if you've been to um, Lion King. So it's quite a nice article I found in Sustainability Science where Bernie talks about these nested patterns and systems. So we have nested patterns of systems which indicate levels of potential in changing the system. So even if you just change one behavior at your own individual level, um, as we've seen with Greta Thunberg, skipping school on Fridays and striking, uh, somehow she's, she's generated a whole paradigm change, um, at least mentally, um, and influencing other systems. So you can change things, systems at a very small level and hopefully hope that some of those patterns will, will work out. And how do you leverage um, bits of the system? So you may be very lucky being a CEO, but 
no one's going to take any notice of you just because you have the title. You've got to work politically, you've got to work with others and network with people like yourself and politicians to lever this fulcrum to get the system moving. Um, so if you want to look at this article, maybe this looks a bit complicated at the moment, but they've got things like how do you change the rules in the system? How do you change the flow of information? How do you change the feedback loops? Um, the reporting of numbers. So there may be little tweaks that you can do, um, like you, you know, if you're trying to eat more healthily. Um, my interview with, with uh, David Probert, you know, he said, I, get, I, I make sure I walk, I change the way I, I, I get to work every day, I actually make sure I build in half an hour walking to work and half an hour walking from work, so at least I can think. Um, so he's changing his kind of behaviours and the way he personally changes. Um, and then this HBR article um, about change agents. There's a very interesting guy called David Crackhard in Carnegie uh, Mellon, who goes into um, organizations where things aren't happening. And he says, where's your organizational chart? And they give him the organizational chart. And so if you look at the formal hierarchy on the left, it says that, okay, Lucas is in charge. Lucas is a CEO, he's head of the team. He's out of this clinical ward or whatever, this surgery chief partner, um, this law firm, and that's how it's supposed to work. So Emma's in charge of this lot, Nathan does that lot, and Vikram does these. Um, Lucas only has three, three people reporting to him, and this is the way the world works. And then David Cracker goes in and actually looks at who's talking to each other, who's actually interacting with other people. And they might find that, I think in this case, Josh, looking at the number of nodes and interactions, everyone talks to Josh. Um, so Lucas, he might only hear four points of view from his formal reports, Emma, Nathan and Vikram talk to Lucas and Josh muscles in and also talks to Lucas. But um, in terms of influence, Lucas um, only, he is like Putin uh, from four people and he only actually talks to Josh uh, in a two-way conversation. So if you can position yourself more practically and more strategically, so, so the advice I guess David Crackard will give to Lucas is probably get out more and listen to a few more people in your organization. You know, you have no idea what Lena's thinking or what Sarah's doing or how Ben is looking at the world. So Lucas has a very depleted, which I guess is what they're saying about Putin, he's only hearing very limited voices. So how on earth can he make systems change or be an effective leader if really his um, evidence and conversations are so small? Whereas Josh seems to know what's going on and he is having two-way conversations, at least with Ben, Vikram and Lucas. Um, so I guess in answer to some of your questions, we're trying to create something like this on the right, uh, despite the constraints of the formal kind of hierarchy and where we may physically sit and who we talk to on an everyday level in terms of norms. So what's really nice about HBR articles is they kind of summarize the whole article, you don't have to read it all. So they have this idea in brief. So the idea in brief, the question was, what makes some people remarkably successful in leading transformational change, um, despite people's resistance? So how come some people like Alex seem to get there on the right, and other people like Chris don't manage it? So they were looking at the social network analysis. And so they did some research on the NHS, actually these American researchers. They did an in-depth analysis of NHS change initiatives and how likely uh, an innovation was to be adopted. The likelihood of adoption often depended, they said, on three features. Um, and these were the findings. So the change agents informal relationships and networks. And they found out that the greater you were uh, in terms of centrality, never mind your job title, um, you were likely to be more successful. 
So if you do know the lady in the canteen serving you, I think Alex Ferguson, uh, famously, he's been interviewed. He knew everyone. He knew the physio. He knew the door person. He knew he knew Doris, who was serving up the lunch at Manchester United Football Club. He knew everyone, and they felt he knew about their families, you know, their health, how they were doing, and he talked to them. He didn't just talk to his star players and his coaching team. So he, Alex Ferguson, if you put him in this, who does actually lecture at Harvard Business School, um, was central, and they loved him. You know, Ronaldo. Rio Ferdinand, I think Ronaldo so calls him dad. Um, although he was in charge, formally, he was also kind of in charge of their emotions and connections informally. And he bridged these, developed a cohesive network linked to the type of change. Um, when they had close relationships with fence sitters, people who won't commit to change or people who are ambivalent, um, you know, they were on their side, they talked to them, they didn't just sideline them. So I guess the, uh, the solution, according to HBR, of course, it's difficult to do it in practice, but how do you make sure you're more of an Alex than a Chris if you want to get things done? How do you build relationships? How are you more like Josh and less like Lucas in this situation? So I hope that gives you some inspiration that's to talk to people you may not normally talk to. So. I, I, I um, interviewed quite a lot of newly qualified nurses and I said, why aren't you working in a Leeds, you know, big, acute medical school, teaching hospital? And they say, you know, it's great here in this little Airedale hospital where they're working because everybody knows your name. Doctors make a few cups of tea. Doctors actually show you how to do things. When a huge, busy, um, acute hospital, nobody knows your name and people just say, no, sorry, if you ask them to help you. Um, so clearly we're all working within massive time constraints and pressures. So it's all very well saying, you know, I'd like to be like Alex, but in practice, clearly it is tough. And there are practical examples. So in the Netherlands, uh, people talk a lot about the Burtzog model, which is about neighborhood care. So here you don't really have any leaders at all. Um, this is a group of nurses um, in this Burtzog model, where they kind of manage themselves, they manage their rotors, um, they manage patient care, they do everything for the patient, they don't split up the tasks. And this is seen as a very successful system that works in a particular part of the world. So there's this quotation from the founder of the Burtzog, we started working with different countries and discovered that the problems are the same everywhere. The message every time is to start again from the patient perspective and to simplify the systems. So in this framework, um, they have the patient in the middle, they have informal networks in the community, they have these birth sort teams, and then they have informal networks outside. But from my understanding is these nurses run themselves. Um, and it's all about looking after the whole person, the whole patient. Instead of, you know, you get someone to look after the healthcare, the social care, someone feeds the patient, someone does specialised treatment for one thing, someone does something else. So um, this has been going for quite a while. Um, and these are some reflections on YouTube. You can look at that YouTube link, Birdsog in the UK. Um, Brendan Martin runs workshops and how you might translate this in different contexts. And he's got some insights um, from three years of doing that, which all sounds great. I don't know what the limitations of that are. Clearly, there, there are many, no doubt. And this is an example for a foundation um, outside healthcare, but it kind of shows in their values what they say in Land, um, Land Kelly Chase, that they're, they're a foundation for funding projects for justice. Um, but they're very focused on systems and the way they do things. So they have these three principles. Our perspective is that we are a group of intelligent people. We have strengths and weaknesses, and we constantly learn and grow with each other. The other value is about participation. People feel safe to ask difficult questions, to voice agreements and disagreements, and deal with conflict and uncomfortable emotions as they surface. And then finally, people closest to a complex situation are free to use their initiative. It's not just power at the top and they are free to take responsibility, which I guess is what the Wurtzog model says. 
And these are words from this foundation. They're not my words. So they say systems change is a process. It's not just a report you write. It's lovely how we're going to do change. It, you know, it's constantly dynamic as well as obviously an outcome. We need tangible outcomes. We need to think of root causes. You have to think of those caterpillars in the situation of malaria earlier, not just about the mosquitoes. Um, going back to Martin Luther King, obviously interconnections are very important between things as well as inside things themselves. And storytelling is very important. So it's not just about changing structures, it's about changing narratives and the way communities and individuals look at things. And it is about something bigger than ourselves. So you may have a very particular view of the world, which I really don't like, and you don't like my view of the world. But I think things like ESG, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, making the NHS a great place to work and safety and so on, they're all things that we can buy into. So as long as we can constructively have our dialogue and conflict while agreeing a sense of common purpose with respect professionally, I think we can kind of live by some of those examples. So we've talked a bit about co-creation. Um, I'll just finish these slides and then we can have some more questions. Feel free to write as we go. So I mentioned Bevan and Henriks earlier and they came up with a little blog in BMJ Leader last year. I think this is something they had in a workshop. But then this is kind of reiterating in seven points what we mean um, by good leadership. So if we look at NATO now, and whatever we're trying to do to try and reduce conflict in Ukraine, hopefully we do have a shared sense of purpose that unites the very disparate NATO members. Um, who are we? What's our identity? We don't want third world war. Um, we want peace. We want this conflict to stop. So we do, we do kind of clearly define. So when things are going wrong, it's very important for leaders to reiterate what is our guiding common purpose. Secondly, at a very human level, how do we make people feel we care about them? So inclusive leadership is about valuing people for what's special, what unique characteristics they bring, maybe expertise, personality, um, as well as it's our responsibility as a team to help people feel a sense of belonging. And clearly we've had a lot of fragmentation during the pandemic and dislocation and isolation and alienation and all that. Um, by reflecting, hopefully we can predict and prevent the next pandemic, climate disaster um, in various processes. Um, people do have a sense of agency it's all very well going off on these CPD events and having lovely ideas and case examples. But, you know, you do need some sense of autonomy, <coughs> some sense that you can make a difference somehow. And it's not just power at the top. There are inequalities, but we want equity, diversity, inclusion and respect at all levels in the system. <coughs> Life is full of paradoxes. And we have these concepts of tough love, bittersweet, um, and and things happening. So last week it was great, today it's snowing. Um, there are lots of contradictions in the system and how do we embrace those? Um, famously, Scott Fitzgerald who wrote The Great Gatsby said a sign of intelligent person is that they can hold opposite ideas, opposable ideas in their head at the same time. So how can you respond to that emergency as well as stand back and reflect? How can you um, deal with these very difficult contradictions and paradoxes that we all face. Um, I'm not always so keen on the word transformation. Sometimes things don't need transforming, um, maybe uh, on a huge scale. Um, but how can we unleash people's energies and appetite uh, for making things better uh, for all of us collectively and continue to learn? And then this final point at the end, you know, even small scale actions and changes, you know, can create. Um, I did walk past a cake shop yesterday on the way home from work and I had in my head, excuse me, I work for a global business school for health. I won't go in the cake shop or hop on the bus. I'll walk home. Um, but that was like a very small action. But hopefully that builds up you know, to bigger, being better 
um, decisions at a personal level and, and, and kind of living the dream of what we're trying to promote um, in the business school. And um, the School for Change um, kind of gives an overview looking to the future. I guess all, all leaders, we all need to think of futures and our own individual futures. So there are various methods, hopefully we've discussed today, we've, we've emphasized various tools that you can use, the, these project management tools like um, stakeholder mapping and so on. And there are lots and lots of sources within the NHS, Health Education England, um, case studies and so on, where you can find inspiring, very short case study examples. But relationship building is critical at an individual level. Who do you have lunch with? Who do you talk to in the corridors? And how do you facilitate change in yourself and in others to coach people to do better? So I think that was a useful kind of reminder, this slide that I picked up. Um, and interdependencies are critical in systems. And we constantly need to think of, you know, what do we need to do now? But also as leaders, what do we need to do in the future that can help um, going forward? And there was this article about ICS and realistic evidence. Of what you know? What do we really need? But that doesn't stop us, you know, hoping or um, optimistically um, for being a little bit unreasonable. Um, George Bernard Shaw, I, I think he said, you know, that the reasonable person adapts them to the current world, but the unreasonable person tries to adapt the world to their vision. So how can we change things for the better rather than just go with the flow of what currently is? And it is about dealing with tensions, dealing with paradoxes, dealing with contradictions and getting the best out of ourselves and others. I think the best leaders I've worked with do that. They help you to grow and they help you to grow not at the expense of others, um, but alongside others. So almost done with the slides. Just some kind of general questions um, from a medic, uh, Ron Heifetz, who's in the Harvard School of Government at um, Harvard University. So it's interesting to get a clinical um, scholar writing about leadership. You might find interesting from this book, The Practice of Adaptive Leadership. So he's saying, you know, the world is constantly changing. And he's kind of posed these questions with his colleague. You know, what kind of organizational change are you leading and managing? You need to kind of diagnose because you were a patient. You need to understand your own leadership style. Um, when I often ask students, it's like, you know, what's your leadership style? It's like, oh, democratic, democratic. It's like, that's not really the answer because if the fire's, if the place is burning down, I don't want you to be democratic. I want you to be um, autocratic. Um, so some understanding of yourself and there are various tools you can do on the internet. Um, questionnaires, understanding yourself and others, your preferred learning style and other styles that maybe you need to work on and other people can compensate for you. What is driving the change in the global healthcare systems and at a local level? In your organization, the culture and the workforce. So clearly we have this Ockerden report to wave in front of people when people say, no, I don't want to learn or excuse me, just look at what happened in Shropshire. Um, Various tools you can use to keep people engaged practically who may be visual or other ways rather than just talking, actually filling out a map is useful. Dealing with politics, the more senior you become um, is very tricky. So you may have a great idea, fabulous team, um, but how do you get your idea through um, and shift power? something very hard to do in practice and clearly we have issues of digital transformation and disruption we're dealing with very complex not complicated or simple problems and sometimes you have to choose the lesser of two evils and then finally or a key message um jeff pfeffer at stanford who's been a business school scholar for I think, 50 years or so said you know it really, really is in any profession. It's the quality of your networks that really will help you get on, um, assuming you do want to get on. So just in summary, um, clearly John, um, Adam Kay here has chosen to leave the medical profession, but he's doing very well in his book and his um, BBC film here, Adam Kay. 
Um, we want you to stay in the medical profession, um, um, but hopefully you've got some useful feedback or some thoughts um, for future series or engagement with us and other CPD events. Um, so it is about engaging with, you know, there is a whole sphere of leadership theory, um, general leadership theory and theory within the healthcare sector that you can engage with. So I've given you a few useful citations. There are lots of examples that you may be able to adapt something in your own circumstance and shape the system that you're working within. And hopefully this will kind of help your career development. Um, or you can you know somebody who can help your career develop through networking and constant learning. And I do firmly um, believe that hybrid leadership and systems leadership are, are critical skills um, for, for people to develop. Some of the most powerful people can bridge boundaries, um, quite different areas of expertise and sectors like Patrick Balance and other people we see around the world who are experts in one sphere who can be very successful in another domain. Um, and unpacking these very complex systems and going back to Mark Bricknell's, you know, what, what the UK is very good at compared with the other nations and how maybe you can form networks through LinkedIn and at conferences and events with people in other parts of the world like Japan with a very aging society is where we clearly are heading. Um, hopefully you can, you can go forward um, with your own CPD to do that. So enough of slides, we will make these available um, and share this recording and ask you for feedback. So I'll stop my share and we just have uh, 12 minutes or so for any further questions in the Q and A. So, Someone asked if there is a certificate for this event. Um, I think uh, we can provide one. Adam uh, Vidler, who organised this, can you can contact him, and um, he can respond to that. Let me see if there's any new questions. Mohammed, you started. Dear Prof, right, Tabasum, do you have any advice on being a hybrid leader? I've worked in pharma, engineering, and now medical education. Well, it sounds like Tabasum, you are a hybrid leader. <laughs> um, um, I guess I do have a little bit of advice. I've been interviewing some dentists recently, and um, one yesterday and one last week who said, I've wasted completely my MBA. So someone's a dentist, they continue as a dentist. Um, they did an MBA in Henley actually, um, and um, loved it. They um, had their own dental practice for three years with a partner who they didn't get along at all with. He said it was the worst three years of my life. And now he's back working um, for Bupa and their local practice. So I wish I could use my skills. So, and a colleague of mine said, you know, we really need to educate this, some people in the system of what to do with these hybrids. So, you know, you show up, you know, I'm a dentist, I've been doing it for 20 years and I've got an MBA. How can I be useful? I don't know, talking to the chief dental officer or others, you know, in helping policy, in changing the system, um, in working with dental chains. So I think it's a very good question. You know, being a hybrid leader, it's one thing, but actually being valued and under people, other people understanding your value is another thing. I think we need to work very hard on that. Um, so hopefully the slides have answered some of your questions and just communicating to other people, you know, that you do have, you do have skills that perhaps specialists don't have. Um, I would like to ask Mohammed. oh, you did answer. What leaders should follow their ethics, the norms, or their contingency? So, um, I've been teaching MBA programs about thirty years now, and I say to people, you know, there's a lot of talk about us being replaced by algorithms, robots, but what you're really paid for as a leader or manager is your judgment. So there are different forms of ethics. There's consequential ethics. Um, UCL we have. Um, Bentham, who talked about utilitarian ethics, 
Kant has different ethics. So, you know, is ethics about everyone feeling good or uh, the good of the whole, even if you have to sacrifice certain people? So that really is what you get paid for in these senior jobs is balancing sometimes impossible situations. And it's like, which ethical principles are we looking at the day, today? Um, are the norms appropriate anymore of the way we've been socialized when I studied medicine 20 years ago? Maybe things have changed because contingencies have changed. Um, so I think all you can do is keep, as Sengi said, keep learning um, and asking questions and being evidence-based researchers and practitioners and engage in dialogue um, and be sensitive to the situation. So ultimately, Mohammed, it comes down to your own judgment. But that doesn't mean to say as a leader, you're on your own. You know, through conversations with others, um, hopefully you can come up with your solutions. Another question, yeah, will it be recorded? and share definitely. Jane, I'd be interested to know if this is quality that is cheaper. Um, so yeah, Bert Sog, if I were you, email someone in the Netherlands, um, email this um, link who's produced a YouTube video, I think he's from Ireland, um, and, and see what, what is going on in terms of quality. If you're having highly qualified nurses treating everything a patient needs uh, rather than you know, divvying it up to healthcare assistants, uh, is that cheaper in the long run and more expensive? So be brave and contact people, I would, in the Bert, Bertzog team. Andrea, thank you very much. Your comments has been a useful session. Uh, Tabasum, does your new book cover these areas? Um, I don't, I have a book on um, business school leadership and our various publications. But um, certainly I'm looking to write something maybe for BMJ Leader um, or Dentistry or other publications looking at hybrid leaders. So definitely, yeah. Graham Curry and his colleagues in India actually have written something about systems leadership in BMJ Leader. Um, but certainly, yeah, the more dentists and medics I talk to who have done MBAs and bridge the gap and have managed to be hybrid leaders. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll look to do an interview with Sir Patrick Balance. So you can, um, you can actually see some of these hybrid leaders in practice and what their views are. And thank you very much. I will now find a, a book contract to, to get from that. So that's been brilliant. Thank you. Very thought provoking questions. Um, saying these things, having these slides is, sometimes very inspiring, but you have a very difficult task of putting this into practice in your very busy jobs. But hopefully, you know, this has given you space, um, this CPD session, to think, you know, there are other opportunities. I've got to keep working on my network. I personally, I started off teaching in a secondary school, a grammar school, all girls school in Kent. Then I went to the NHS, worked in HR, change management, then I ended up working for business schools, taking business school deans around the world. So I've, I personally have changed careers several times, did a PhD quite late in my career at Warwick. Always taught an MBA with the Open University, but now I'm launching um, the MBA in Health with University College London, the world's first MBA health um, business school. So I think um, my key message finally to wrap up is, you know, we're always learning. You can reinvent yourself. There are lots of opportunities out there and there's a real shortage of effective leaders. And as we've seen in the political sphere, in politics, the world leadership, um, clearly a lot of them, a lot of the time are getting not everything right. Um, so if you aspire to leadership positions, want to improve your own session, uh, follow Ron Heifetz. Wendy Purcell has just emailed me to endorse Ron Heifetz. Please do do that. There's lots on there's lots on YouTube, lots out there. And contact Ron directly. You know, it's amazing how supportive people are. Or Wendy Purcell, who's one of our um, honorary professors and executives, and residents as well. So do keep in touch. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you perhaps at future events. Um, 
CPD we'll, we'll keep in touch with you thank you very much for your time and keep in touch and good luck so we'll end the uh, we'll end the recording now